Hey everybody. Um, this is our presentation about John Paul Sartre, the world, self, others, and no exit. Um, John Paul Sartre won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Um, he has made a lot of plays. He wrote novels. Um, he wrote um, works of philosophy. Um, a lot of his works, um, all of his works are trying to explain his ideas about um, life, kind of like ethics. Of course, he's a phenomenologist. He was very influenced by Heidegger. Um, so, yes, he's like a phenomenologist, but um, he wrote literature and he expressed those ideas in literature. But these are some of his ideas. So, uh, then you, through this, I think you can understand a basic part of Sartre. So this is just some background about him. Um, Sartre says, everyone gets what he deserves. He spent time in a Nazi prison during World War II, but not in a concentration camp. Um, he angered, he was angry whenever his countrymen collaborated with the German army, he was French. Uh, he thought that they were cowardly, hypocritical, and they should help the resistance. Um, so basically Sartre believes that we all have choices no, no matter the situation and to deny that we don't have choices is basically lying to ourselves, which he calls a bad faith. This is an outline of what we are going to talk about. Um, so basically humans give meaning to the world, but humans are also dependent on the world, which is like a phenomenological idea that our existence depends on our environment but um, you know, we also interact with our environment. We give meaning to the, to the environment. We have freedom to critique our own past and rise above it. Uh, so this is a big, very big idea about Sartre is that we have freedom to rise above our past and also to decide whether we will continue following in the footsteps that we've done, made so far or just completely start new, start over. Um, we have that freedom. That's what it means to be a human. To deny that we have this freedom to start over at any time is called bad faith. This is basically lying to ourselves. Just to say like, oh, you know, my past determines who I am and I can't break free. That's basically lying to ourselves. And that's called bad faith. And of course, there would be reason to um, do that sometimes because to embrace our freedom, Sartre calls anguish, which is kind of like um, kind of like a painful word because it's you know it's painful to realize that we cannot control our future selves. Like for example, um, you know maybe I I don't want to do something that could hurt me, but I don't know what my future self will do, and so um, because I basically can't control my future self because I don't know what I'll do in the future. The past cannot control the present or the future. And just that fact gives us anguish. We are all also subject to being criticized by others. So basically for Sartre, humans are giving meaning to the world and we are the, I guess, the givers of meaning. We say like, oh, it's this, it's not that. But all humans are like that. So that means that um, other humans are making decisions about us and we are getting judged. We are getting, um, you know, criticized. And so that's also like a painful thing. And that's why a big reason why Sartre calls, says hell is other people because other people are judging us and, um, you know, not giving us what we want. Um, we can't control them. And um, yeah, but they can, they can, objectify us in a sense through their judging us. But of course, if we just accept their judgments, that would be bad faith. We can always rise above, which is like the fact of freedom. So Sartre uses this story about the fox and the grapes. What? The, so the fox wants those delicious grapes, but he can't reach them. So what should the fox do? You know, he's trying, he's jumping, he's jumping. What should I do? I can't get the grapes. So here's what the fox does. He gets tired and he says, 
I'm sure those grapes are sour. He says, you know, maybe those grapes weren't good. He interprets the situation differently and that changes the world, right? It, it make, he basically says, oh, those grapes are not that valuable. He made a decision about the world. He critiqued the world. And that's basically what Sartre is about. It's about our power to judge. So what is this for, this beautiful mountains? Sartre's mountains, it could be a sacred object, like a holy place. It could be an obstacle to climb, or it could be protection against enemies. Right? So we could use, we could see this mountain in many different ways, but we as humans have to give meaning to the world and decide how we're gonna think about this mountain. Sartre on the imagination. So for Sartre, um, a synthesis of the world into unity, into a unity, right? So um, whenever we are giving meaning to the world, we might, like, for example, if we think about this mountain, um, we might say like, oh, this mountain, this could be used kind of like as a castle. And so basically we synthesize those ideas, a mountain as a castle, and therefore the mountain could become a protection. And that's basically how um, humans give meaning to the world. They cancel the real world and by making something new, they cancel what exists by going beyond it. So, you know, because as humans, we've seen a lot of things in our lives, we know what a castle is. So we could imagine this as a castle and maybe, you know, we could maybe even, you know, um, make it look like a castle or treat it like a castle. We could maybe hide in the inside or, you know, um, let it be a protection against enemies. But it's because we have those um, different ideas in our mind, we can create a synthesis. And that synthesis will create something new. Um, but whenever we do that, we are also negating, which means canceling. So for example, because this has become a castle in my mind, it's no longer going to be maybe an obstacle. Like we wouldn't, I wouldn't see it as an obstacle anymore, or I wouldn't see it as like a holy place anymore. So, you know, that's basically what Sartre is about, giving meaning to the world and also which would cancel out other meanings. Um, so I was reading about this example in a book. So what if we wanted to create something completely new, like a Zybertron? Like that's a nothing, you know, we've never heard of that. But um, the only way we can make something new is to base it on existing materials. So, um, yeah, so our, yeah, that's basically what it is to be human for Sartre. We have an imagination, but our imagination is dependent on the things that we see and the things that we know in the world that already exist. By using those things that already exist, we can combine them, which is synthesis, and through that make a new concept or a new idea. And that's how humans act upon the world, is like through synthesis and negation. So also same, likewise, um, this is Sartre on emotions. Emotions are directed toward something, which is like intentionality. It's like, um, right, we have, we don't just love, we love something. We don't just hate, we hate something. So like our emotions are directed towards things or people. And um, sometimes our emotions can be so powerful that they might even threaten our freedom, right? So freedom, like we said, is like the, what it means to be a human is to, you know, be able to move beyond our past, be able to make decisions, um, be able to change at any time, uh, not be, uh, you know, confined to our past. But sometimes powerful emotions can threaten this freedom. Like, for example, we talked about anguish. What if we're feeling so afraid that, um, you know, we can't move forward? That can threaten our freedom. But emotions can also help us deal with the world. So, for example, um, if we want to feel like comfort, maybe protection, um, we can, you know, transform the world to something that is more um, easy for us to deal with easier for us to um, 
cope with and understand. So we could be like the fox where he magically transforms the world. Right before when the grapes looked delicious, it was hard to deal with that situation. But if we imagine that they are not delicious, then it's easier to like walk away. I also put Goku here because you know he's he keeps changing, he keeps growing. He he's not, you know, this Goku is different from this Goku. And um, yeah, so that's basically like Sartre is like we are always growing and have the potential to be something new. There you go. So for Sartre, the imagination and emotions show that we exist. Um, we are aware of the world, we interact with it, therefore we exist. So it's like, because we are alive, we're conscious, because we see the world, that's the proof of our existence. Like um, we exist because there's a world. There, without the world, there is no self. And because we're aware of it, we can interact with it. So here are the Sartrean terms that we'll talk about in this presentation. Being in itself, which is existence, basically the world and the universe. Being for itself, which is consciousness, which is the human, like seeing the world. Facticity, this is like our past and things that we cannot change, like our parents or um, you know, where we were born. Transcendence is our future hopes and dreams, things that we can work towards. Bad faith, this is just lying to ourselves, usually just saying that like, oh, you know, I have no transcendence, I can't change anything, which is just a lie. Anguish, um, this is the feeling that we get whenever we recognize our freedom just to see how you know, we are completely free to do anything, which can be scary. Being for others, this is us being judged by others and the other person labeling us. And um, yeah, that's what that's like. Conflict and love. So for Sartre, freedom and love are in conflict because whenever you love someone, you want to hold on to them, you want to keep them, you... Um, you don't want them to be free. You want them to be with you. And so um, it's basically like love is kind of keeping people from reaching their potential for Sartre. So let's get started. So there is being in itself. This is existence. We can just think the world as it is. The world when we don't interpret it. It just is. It's just um, opaque, which is just like blank, it's huge, it's just there, it's nebulous. Um, so I think of this as just like, you know, what if there is a world and no one has ever seen it before? Um, there might be some trees that nobody has ever seen or, or discovered or, and you know, we might not even know if they are trees. They might look a little bit like trees, but you know, no one has ever seen them. Um, so anyway, it's kind of just like the world without humans is being in itself, no one to attach meaning to, the, to it. So um, it's basically just a blob, you know? It could, yeah. Being for itself. So this is consciousness, what the human is. Um, so basically, conscious beings escape the being in itself. So like we are, we're not just part of the blob of like, where there's just like, you know, floating, um, there's no meaning, but the human comes out of that um, blob, that, um, you know, that existence. And as we come out, um, we are able to, you know, see, and we are the ones who give meaning to the world. So we escape the, the being in itself, and this is an important idea of Sartre is existence precedes essence. So we first exist, but then we make our own essence. We determine our own identity. That's what that means. So, you know, we exist, but we're just like the blob, just like the rest of the world. Am I a tree or am I a rock? You know, I don't know. But by moving forward and by acting in the world, we... Um, give meaning to our lives and we give ourselves an identity. And the further, we always have freedom to like keep progressing that identity. And um, 
So that's what existence precedes essence. It's basically, I give myself an identity. And so like, this is like a, Sartre is of course an atheist. And this is like a very like kind of atheistic idea is that, um, you know, we give ourselves the meaning, the identity. Um, yeah, so man is not already made, he makes himself. Man chooses what he becomes. Being for itself, consciousness as nothingness. So consciousness is empty. So without the world, there is no self. Um, an emptiness filled through its awareness of the world. Um, so this just means that like as a human, um, if there was no world, there would be no I, right? But because we, we observe the world, we see the world, um, this, and we, we interact with the world because we are seeing the world and making decisions about it. And um, yeah, so that is basically giving us our existence is by seeing the world, interacting with it. And um, without the world, we wouldn't exist, but that seeing it and interacting with it is, is why we exist. So yeah, so um, as we come to exist, we turn around and we say, oh yeah, I'm not just that blob that I'm just not, I'm not just a rock or a tree. Um, I turn around and then I make decisions about my own past, like who I was 10 minutes ago, maybe 10 years ago. And I also make decisions about my environment. So not only am I judging the world and like the, the food or you know the rocks or the trees and giving them names and things like that, I'm also judging myself do I wanna keep going in this path or do I wanna go in a different path? So as humans, we have that freedom and that's like a basic part of being a human is like the ability to choose our path and um, make decisions. So facticity, this is who we were. Facts about us that we cannot change. Things that we have done in the past that are frozen. Who we are, where we are from and who our parents are. Of course, these things in the past do influence our identity and we cannot change them, but we can also act differently from them. We have the power to um, you know, be different from our parents. We have the power to move somewhere else. We have the power to act differently than how we've acted in the past. But we can't change the past, but we can change the present. So, you know, this is the picture of a two parents with a child, we can't change the parents. But the transcendence, the child can make decisions about how the child wants to live in the future. Does the child want to be different from the parents or continue being the same? Does it want to be a doctor or maybe a lawyer or a fireman or a teacher? So the transcendence is what we hope to become, where we're working towards, walking towards. It's our desires and plans that are beyond fact, our desires that haven't happened yet. For example, you plan to become a doctor, but you are not one yet. That's your transcendence. So it's basically, it's important to recognize that we have the transcendence, that we're capable, that we're able to become doctors if we want to. So being for itself, consciousness as nothingness. So actions speak louder than words. This is basically to say that our actions um, reflect our identity that we're building. Um, so we project our own ideals and we try to obtain them, which basically is like to say like, hey, these are the things that I want in life and I'm working towards them. That's like, you know, your transcendence. Freedom is human reality. What one does reveals what one is. So, right, so we could say all day like, oh, I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm gonna be a doctor, but it's only until we actually um, you know, get the diploma, do the classes that we become a doctor. The actions is what like reveals what we are. So humans are free to deny their past and become something new. Humans are also free to give meaning to the environment. Uh, I thought of this picture of um, 
Aladdin and Princess Jasmine, and they're looking at the whole new world. Maybe you've heard of that song. So, you know, they're looking at the world in a new way as maybe as a couple. They're in, maybe because they're in love, they can enjoy the world together in a, in a new way and see the world in a different way, maybe because they're seeing it together. Um, so yeah, that's basically what we have the freedom to do. We have the freedom to deny their past, maybe before, you know, he was a poor guy. Um, but he has the freedom to say, hey, no, I'm not just a poor guy. I can be like a prince if I want to. I can become something new. Um, humans are also free to give meaning to their environment. And I think that's what they're doing now. They're like, oh yeah, we could go over there. We could go over here. And I think that's what they're doing with that song. If maybe if you saw that movie. So here we are being for itself, consciousness as nothingness, like the role of the human in the world. Humans give meanings to objects and environment. Objects appear either as obstacles or stepping stones. So, right, so we could, when we look at the world, we could see the, you know, I guess that's like coal. And, you know, if you press down into the coal, the coal by itself is basically worthless, but if you press, 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 it's going to become a diamond. And so can you see the diamond and the coal or is the coal just have no value? Um, so basically, you know, it's Sartre emphasizes our perspective a lot. Um, that's the power of being a human. Being for itself, consciousness as nothingness. So the process of annihilation, like I said um, a little bit earlier, um, like we, as we synthesize something, like for example, as the mountain becomes a fortress or a castle, it's no longer a, you know, something to climb or, or a holy place. Um, the process, this is a process of annihilation, like um, cutting off the, the in itself's potential. Um, so like we also distance ourselves from the paper. We make the paper distinct from everything else. Um, a table is a table, not wood for fire. So yeah, just, um, yeah, you know, we, like I said, we make dis decisions about the world. You know, oh, this is a paper, that's not me. Um, oh, this is a table, it's not a wood, it's not wood for fire. Oh, that mountain, that's not just a mountain, it's a castle, right? We're making, we're saying that this is not something else, it's this. And that's basically the role of the of humans, is like making decisions about the world. So bad faith, this is a very important idea for Sartre. It's denying your ability to make a new path, right? It's like to say, oh yeah, well, because I was this in the past, Maybe because I'm a criminal, I'll always be a criminal or something like that. Or, you know, because I, um, you know, I don't know, because I, I, I don't know, I didn't, you know, maybe because I'm, I'm, I'm too old to write a book or something like that. You know what I mean? These kind of excuses about life, like we deny our ability to make a new path, even though as a human, we always have the ability to make a new path. It's confusing, bad faith is confusing our facticity, which are, is our past with our transcendence to say like, oh, well, you know, I, my, my goal, my goal is just to do what I already have. Like, um, you know what I mean? The, the transcendence is supposed to be our goals and our future plans. We're not a doctor yet, but we wanna become one. But our facticity is, you know, we're not a doctor. So we could just say, oh yeah, I'm not a doctor. I'll never be a doctor. That would be bad faith because we have the transcendence. We have the ability to rise above. Um, so self-deception, this is bad faith. It's just basically lying to ourselves. The lie, you don't have other choices. But as Sartre says, we always have choices. So bad faith, here's one of Sartre's examples about bad faith. Um, he thinks of a waiter who thinks only about being a waiter. He is and will never be anything else. So basically, um, something Sartre liked to do was hang out in Parisian cafes and just write all day. And he was looking at a waiter one day 
and he thought that that waiter was really focused on being a waiter. He thought that the waiter wasn't dreaming about, you know, starting a new life. He thought that the waiter was thinking, I'm always going to be a waiter, so I'll just focus on this. He thought that that waiter didn't have a transcendence. So, um, yeah, that would be something that is just lying to ourselves, that we don't have the ability to rise above. Also, fainting is another example of bad faith. It's like to say, like, um, or a way to avoid a difficult situation as, as escaping reality. Um, you know, maybe this, like, you know, he has this idea about maybe there's a guy who is like hitting on a girl. He's maybe touching her hand and maybe touching her waist. But the girl, you know, she doesn't want to say yes. She doesn't want to say no. So she just goes, you know. She just kind of denies her choices. Um, of course, you know, you could see it in another way that fainting is a choice as a way to deny. But like fainting is kind of an, ex is, is a, an example of bad faith because it's basically to say, oh yeah, I don't, I'm not able to choose, so I just won't do anything. You could probably think about it as a rather neurotic thing, like we talked about with Lacan and Zizek, but just to say like, yeah, I don't want to change the situation, so I'll just do nothing. That's bad faith. So now we're on to anguish, which is you know the feeling that recognizing our freedom, what it feels like to be free, what it is to be free. My past does not control my present. Right? My past, it's already over. It's decided already. And it doesn't have any control over what I'll do right now because the past is over, it's done. So he gives an example of a gambler who gambled too much in his book, um, Being in Nothingness. So the gambler promised himself, I won't gamble again. I'll never gamble again because he gambled too much and maybe it hurt his family. Maybe he lost all of the money. So he says, I will never gamble again. But that was in the past. He said that maybe 20 minutes ago. So next time he goes by the pachinko or the casino, his promise in the past does not decide his present or his future. So even though he says he won't gamble, there is nothing stopping him next time he walks by the casino, next time he walks the, by the pachinko, there's nothing stopping him from going inside and gambling again. His promise, it doesn't affect his future. It would be a lie to say that the promise would affect his future. And that's why it would be anguish because it's scary. Like we don't want to, he doesn't want to go to the pachinko because he knows how dangerous it is, but there's nothing stopping him from going there except for his like present self in that moment. Okay, so anguish, born to be free. It's for Sartre, it's like we're condemned to be free. Like there's nothing we can do except be free. So even my present doesn't control my future possibilities. My present, I don't know what my future self will do. If I'm walking on the edge of a mountain, I can't control if my future self will jump off or not. So that's why that would be pretty scary if you're just you know, on the top of that mountain because you're just one second away. What if, what if me in 10 minutes has a different thought and then I just decide, woo, jump. And then suddenly I realize, oh, wow, I don't know what my future self will do. I can't control my future self. 10 minutes from now, there's no telling what I'll start thinking or what I'll start doing. And that uncertainty starts to give us anguish, starts to give us maybe fear to realize how free we actually are. We can't control our future selves. So being for others, this is basically how we are in the eyes of others. How do we know if other people are not robots, right? How do we know? We know when they look at us. We know they're not robots because of their eyes. Because when they look at us, we feel that they're judging us and making you know, decisions about us. We're always on trial when others are always judging us. When someone else sees us stealing, we feel them judging us, right? If we're like stealing something, we don't really feel bad until we see someone's eyes and saying, oh, look at you, bad guy. You did such a bad thing. 
and all of a sudden, oh, oh no, I feel bad. You know, I feel I feel shame. I feel their I feel their judgments. Right. We must decide to accept the identity of a thief or not. Right. Um, so you know, whenever other people judge us, that's that's you know that's them labeling us. That's putting an identity on us. And, you know, we have to be pretty strong to overcome those, like, bad things that people may say about us. We have to have a strong um, belief in our transcendence to overcome those um, judgments from others. Bad faith is seeing ourselves only as others do, right? That would be bad faith just to say, oh, yeah, he said I'm a thief. So, you know, I'm a thief. I'm nothing but a thief. But, you know, if we grab onto the anguish and say, well, hey, dude, I'm not just a thief. I can, I can change my life. I can do something good if I want. I can do whatever I want to. I have power over my life. Being for others, part two. Our relationships with others are essentially conflict, right? Because, you know, I want this person to do this for me. This person wants me to do something that they want me to do. And so like, we both have our desires and we want, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. And that creates conflict and tension because um, we're both seeing the world in different ways. Relationships are struggles for self-definition, right? So like, I want to be a hero. I want to be cool, but maybe your, your, um, your lover or significant other will think, um, like, no, I just want you to, I just want you to love me and give me love. And no, I want, I want to be you to say I'm a hero. Well, I don't care if you're a hero. I just want you to love me. That was one of the conflicts that was in No Exit, which we will read in our class. So they're both struggling for self-definition, like how they will be perceived. My conception of myself largely depends on others' view of me, right? So, you know, of course, you know, so we want, if we want to be a hero, we want other people to say that we're a hero. That will, you know, confirm um, who we, that will like confirm our transcendence and be like, yeah, I am a hero. They're calling me a hero and I'm, that's helping me get to my goals. But of course, it doesn't depend completely on others' views of you, but it does influence that. Being for others. My conception of myself largely depends on others' view of me. Very good. So if no one saw Jean Gannett stealing, would he struggle with the identity? Garçon, is he a hero or a coward? So basically, um, Garçon is a main character in No Exit. And, you know, for most of his life, he was a hero. But at the very end of his life, he did something very uh, cowardly or weak. And so um, at the end of his life, there was some bad rumors that spread about him. Like, oh, Garson, he's, you know, he did something bad at the end of his life. So he's, he's a weak guy. He's probably a coward. So love is also conflict um, winning over the other. So like this could just be, you know, I want you to do this for me. I want you to be this for me. Well, I want you to be this for me. I want you to be this for me. The aim of love is not pleasure, but control and manipulation, making sure the other person loves me. Yeah, so it's kind of like, that's this is Sartre's idea, you know, you don't have to agree with this, but freedom lets you leave. It's basically like saying like, we should be free as humans, but this idea of love is kind of in the way of freedom. And so um, this is based on Hegel's master and slave theory. Um, yes, yeah, submissive one becomes dominant. So in the master and slave theory of um, Hegel, I'm just gonna give a very simple idea about this. It's basically the master is depending on the slave and saying, hey, slave, you need to uh, make my food. You need to clean my clothes. You need to, um, you know, run the house for me. And so as the slave is doing these things, as he's cooking, as he's cleaning, as he's, you know, 
taking care of everything. The slave is actually getting control and power. And um, that by, by taking on the, the work, um, the, the master is becoming weak and the master is now dependent, depends on the slave and he can't live without the slave. And so the slave starts to become the powerful one, right? Um, the submissive one becomes dominant. Right? The person who says, yes, I'll do that, actually becomes the powerful one. The master becomes dependent, needs the other for pleasure and for help. So conflict in love, part three. Love is either masochism, which means um, right, becoming what the lover wants you to become, um, denying your own freedom. Right? Masochism means you hurt yourself. So love is either like, oh yeah, you want me to be like this, that, and this? Yeah, I'll be like that. And then you're actually like hurting yourself. You're denying your, your future goals and you're conforming to what the other person wants you to do. So you're actually just finding pleasure in pain. Um, that's masochism. Sadism is where you enjoy hurting the other person, treating the lover as an object and tying them down and saying like, oh yeah, I'm enjoying um, having my, the other person, um, you know, denying their hopes and their dreams. I enjoy doing that. That's kind of like sadistic, which is not good, right? Sadistic is like you're enjoying hurting people. And that's what Sartre is saying about love. It's either masochistic where you hurt yourself or it's sadistic where you're enjoying hurting others. Because love, he thinks, is against freedom. So we're going to talk about these questions in class. Um, but anyway, we'll talk about those in class. Here is our bibliography. Thank you for your time and look forward to talking about this more in class. <laughs>